Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. ¿Qué pasó, chicos? Soy Rob, y en este video, vamos a hacer algo diferente. No! <laughs> What's going on, guys? This is Rob. In this video, we're doing something different. <laughs> That's that's how you that's I thought I had it right. You had everything except the you said has like hey sir. Hey sir? Yeah. Has say has sir. Vamos a hacer. Okay. Vamos a hacer. ¿Qué pasó chicos? Soy Rob. Y en este video vamos a hacer algo diferente. Good job. Awesome. <laughs> okay, everybody heard you talking by the way. I know. <laughs> What's going on guys, this is Rob and we are doing something different in this video. Uh, we are, we're gonna cover World's Funnest. And I figured what better way to cover World's Funnest than to have fun when we're when we're covering at least the beginning of World's Funnest. Now, this is a spoof comic and it's a spoof comic based on the story of World's Finest. Now, World's Finest was a publication that DC launched between 1941 and 1956, I think. But the overall idea was originally, World's Finest wasn't really a team up between Batman and Superman, so much as it was a comic book that basically contained both the characters. Now, given the cover of the comic, it was basically like 1940s clickbait. It's more or less what it was. <laughs> but in, in, in World's Finest issue number 71, that's when you first saw Batman and Superman crossover in that comic. And the reason why was because they had crossed over previously in a Superman comic. So uh, at that point, the World's Finest comics with issue number 71 going to its conclusion basically had Batman and Superman teaming up against some kind of villains. More often than not, Batman got powers so that it wouldn't just be like, here's a guy in a bat suit fighting alongside a guy who can do everything right so like they they kind of gave him powers in order to, to kind of nip that in the bud but world's finest came out is is kind of a, a parody based on that right based on the the world's finest concept and this initially opens up with batman superman and uh and robin dick grayson basically capturing lex Luthor and the joker now as you see this comic written that's how world's finest was done back then it was it was just these weird little turns of phrase and so on and then they were they weren't really goofy so much as just kind of far more lighthearted than what you see right now it was really kind of the best way to describe it but but immediately things start to pop off, right? Like the bands that are that are used to tie up Joker and Lex Luthor immediately come free of their own volition. And then you have like two giant mannequins that kind of manifest and then start tearing things up, right? Now Superman and Batman kind of jump into it and the Joker is seemingly subdued in a pretty rough way, right? Like Batman literally jumps on the, on the mannequin which lands on the Joker's back and like damages his spine. That's how comics were back then. Like keep in mind, in the first issue, I think it was Batman, either Detective Comics 27 or Batman number one. I'm pretty sure it was Detective Comics number 27. Batman and hung a guy from the bat wing, right? So like back then it was pretty rough. Like it was, it was pretty intense, pretty hardcore. But of course, Joker and Lex Luthor are subdued pretty quickly. But then the question becomes, how did all these things start manifesting? Enter Batmite. Now Batmite has a pretty lengthy history in DC comics. He's been around for a pretty good chunk of time. Not nearly as long as Mixopidilic, but he's basically the Batman equivalent of him. But as far as I understand, maybe a little less powerful. I think their, their power levels kind of wax and wane and sort of change, but that's the nature of this, right? This story is where you see Mixopidilic at his most powerful. But Batmite was basically the one who kind of orchestrated all of this because he wanted to see Batman and Robin in action. Now, that was usually the idea behind Batmite, and that's what differentiated him between Mr. Mixopidilic. Mixopidilic would pop up to make Superman's life hard, right? Like, he would just make him go through all these riddles and jump through all these weird hoops and all that kind of stuff. Batmite was, wasn't really a bungling buffoon, but he wanted to see Batman in action. And so he would create these weird, wonky situations where Batman and Robin would have to cope with the various craziness that he had. Now, there were a couple reasons for why DC did that. The first was because they didn't want to create a Batman counterpart that was identical to Mixopidilic because then people would see him as a cheap ripoff and they wouldn't really care about him. But the other part of this is that where the Batman comics were, were not exceedingly dark, they weren't as dark as they are now, right? You weren't reading the 1940s version of like The Court of Owls by Scott Snyder. But by and large, there were some darker elements like what you wouldn't see right now. But in order to kind of lighten him up a bit, as well as bring in younger audiences, we got Robin. And Robin was kind of a breath of fresh air in the sense of like a little kid or a younger guy fighting alongside Bruce Wayne. And so Batmite was introduced it's kind of that counterpart, right? Kind of a building on that sort of not really happy-go-lucky, but somewhat sort of lighthearted concept. Now he did do some stuff that was pretty wonky and some stuff that was kind of dark from time to time, but if anything, he's more of just a Batman fan. Now around the time that Batman appears, so does Mixopidilic. And the two of them don't really have any, I mean, there's no love loss here, right? They don't really like each other because Mixopidilic will see Batmite as getting in the way of his ability to play jokes on Superman, to mess with Superman, different things like that. And so as the two of them begin to go back and forth, it gets kind of nuts, right? Like literally Mixopidilic ends up like you have this this giant sign for some chicken restaurant or something like that. Mixopidilic brings the chicken to life and then Batmite turns the chicken into like a giant cooked chicken. They're kind of countering each other's powers. And then from there, of course, Batman step 
steps in and is like, look guys, like you guys gotta stop. You know, this is gonna kinda get out of hand. And then as soon as Mixopidolic goes to launch a blast against uh, against Batmite, he moves out of the way and Batman gets hit. And so Batman, dies, right? Like he's killed by, by Mixopidolic. And like literally Batmite just start, kind of starts breaking down, right? Because he's he's a fan of Batman, right? Like Batmite is a fan of Batman and it's crushing to see his superhero killed in such a way. Also, there's there's the fact that Batmite recognizes that Batman's so popular that DC would lose money if they killed him, which is why DC's never killed Batman. He's too popular and he makes too much cash. <laughs> That's why he always wins. But nonetheless, so with that happening, like Mixopidolic's like, hey man, I'm sorry. I didn't really mean for it to happen. And, and Superman's like, God, man, I can't believe he did that. And and so, so in response to that, Batmite ends up basically manifesting this giant magnifying glass along with a with a red sun. This, I mean, look at this. He creates a red sun out of nowhere. Now, here's the thing. This is why these comics are kind of goofy. If we're talking about the actual laws of physics in our universe, the Earth would probably be ripped apart by the gravitational pull of that sun. I mean, you could have a small red sun like that, but the gravitational pull would be equivalent to the sun, like to a regular red sun, right? So you're so it would it would be insane, right? This would probably lead to the creation of a black hole, if I'm being honest with you guys. But regardless. Regardless, this is comic books. Just go with it. <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson, if you're watching this, just watch it. Just, just have fun, man, and don't analyze it. But nonetheless, using this, this red sun and then this magnifying glass, it's like cooking an ant, right? Like literally it burns, like it, it shuts down Superman's powers and then destroys him, right? Literally, literally just like burns a hole in him. After that, Mixel gets pissed off. So he basically creates a giant hole puncher and starts hole punching Robin. Then he turns around and takes out Lois Lane. He's like, guess what, girl? Like you're dumb. Superman was always Clark Kent and literally creates like a giant stack of newspapers that read Clark Kent is Superman, Lois Lane is dumb. <laughs> Which is kind of funny. Jimmy Olsen's like, man, this sucks because I'm not going to be able to get with like Lois Lane's sister. And, and Perry's like, who cares about that, man? Like, what a scoop. Superman is Clark Kent. Dude, that's going to make us a boatload of money in sales. And so then from there, you have Jimmy Olsen and you have Perry White who are killed by the giant Daily Planet sign. So then you have you have Mixel Pit like chasing after Batmite, trying to hit him with a newspaper, right? Because you kill flies with newspapers. And then here comes Supergirl and here comes Batwoman and here comes a couple other people. I don't know who they are, but they're just kind of like freaking out over the fact that like Batman and Superman and Robin are, are all destroyed. Destroyed. And then like Mixopidolic and Batmite kind of start arguing, like who in the world did this? And it's like, well, you know, Mixopidolic was the one who, who killed all these guys. And he's like, yeah, but that's because you killed Superman. It's like, yeah, but like, like you killed Batman, you know? And it's like, like, it was okay for me to do what I did. And so like at that point, like all the girls start crying. And so like Mix, uh, Mixel, Mixopidolic just starts to get annoyed by all their crying. And so when they ask for some tissues, he manifests a giant box of Kleenex, which all basically come pouring out and then wrap all the girls and then basically like suffocate them. And then like, they're, they're like super pets, avenge us, right? So you get super pets from the 19, 1940s and 50s. Now, back in the 1950s when Mort Weisinger was writing Superman, they just created stuff. It was nuts. There were no limits, right? His idea was create something new with the Superman mythos every six months, and it proved to be successful, right? Like, under the 10 years that Mort Weisinger was the editor of Superman, dude, it was it was the highest selling comic DC had at the time. Like, this is this era right here that you're looking at, this is kind of a spoof. This was at the time when it was Silver Age Superman, when he could do anything, right? Like, he had whatever he needed at any particular time based on what the plot called for. So, like, it was, it was kind of nuts but like all the all the super animals are basically taken out mixopedalic just creating like super fleas they take out like all the animals and then joker and lex luther are freaking out they're having the time of their life and so mixopedalic in turn like makes lex luther's hair grow out to the point that he can't really control it anymore it starts to strangle him and then it starts tickling the joker so the so lex luther gets strangled and the joker dies of laughter and then like mixopedalic starts freaking out like look at what you made me do like like who am i gonna annoy on this planet right like i've, I've basically killed everybody who matters you know and so batman's response is well like the justice league is coming so like mixopidolic i mean you know and, and really kind of even batmite at the same time sort of turn on the justice league like it's it's kind of these off-color remarks right like mixopidolic makes his comment to wonder woman when he like smashes her with a giant fly swatter that like your invisible jet might be invisible but you're not and then like the green lantern gets smashed by a giant banana because back at that point in the 1950s the green lantern's weakness was the color yellow so it's just like oh my god it's a banana and like that's what kills the green lantern because he's weak you know he's weak to the color yellow like uh, this is stupid and then like like the flash trips over the banana peel and and then he lands in the uh, in like this giant skillet, so he gets cooked alive and he dies. You know, the, the Green Lantern basically ends up getting like cut in half in a mousetrap. John Jones gets set on fire with a giant lighter. Arrow gets killed with like a giant dart. Uh, Aquaman's just kind of like, I gotta go, man. Like I gotta bounce because like I need water. And and what could he really even do anyway? Right? As Aquaman, Aquaman sucks. So like the Legion of Superheroes appear and they just kind of end their own existence, right? Because they're like, we've seen everything that you've done here and you've destroyed all these heroes, which means that we'll never exist. And then they disappear. <laughs> 
and then they, they basically just cease to exist in the timeline. And so in effect, within the span of probably about 10 minutes, Mr. Mixopidelic has basically wiped out every single superhero on Earth. They're all basically gone. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. Part two will come out tomorrow. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Core. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.